Now, I want to be fair about this because often the left spends a lot of time attacking each other. But I do think that they really missed the mark here. So Ojala is a grassroots outlet founded by Don Paley, uh, who's covered Mexico for many years. I happen to disagree with many of her perspectives. I think she played a really negative role in the aftermath of the 2019 coup in Bolivia, amplifying critiques in a moment where I think it was about closing ranks and defending the democratic constitutional order of Bolivia. And actually, I think you do your enemies favors by choosing that moment. It's not to say that we shouldn't be making critiques, but doing it in that moment, I think, is counterproductive. Similarly, I saw some language in NACLA. I have respect for NACLA. NACLA has done some very excellent reporting that I think is uh, worthy of respect. Now, I'm not trying to dunk on them, but I do think that when you are replicating the same ideas that Morena is a threat to bourgeois democracy, you're not being playing a productive role. Oh, I was just going to say she published a piece in The Nation just before the 2021 midterms, right? That yeah. Amla was the worst president in the galaxy. You can say what you want, of course, but the timing was, you know, just exactly. days before the midterm elections, I mean, right? Yeah. I don't, uh, I don't agree with it, right? And, and I want to say that respectfully because, again, I'm not trying to dunk on them. I'm not trying to score points. I mean, I think she feels differently. In fact, I, uh, I went on a, on a podcast uh, with Ben Norton, the, the older one he had, uh, with Max Blumenthal, and uh, she blocked me on Twitter as a result. Didn't criticize me. Didn't say what she disagreed with. Just blocked me. You know, the, I found that frustrating because so many of these people come to Mexico saying they're, they're here to give voice to the voiceless. But I guess certain Mexican voices should be silenced. But anyway, point is, this is, this, is, uh, this is their headline, right? This is their editorial response to the election. Scheinbaum will be Mexico's next president, but the military holds the reign. And so I'm going to extensively read it so that we can kind of break it down here together. Uh, Claudia Scheinbaum's electoral victory on June 2nd marked a turning point in Mexican history by electing the country's first female president. But it is imperative to go beyond the symbolism in the country's top office to examine the balance of forces that condition presidential power today. So first of all, I disagree with calling it symbol symbolic. It's one thing for a woman from an ethnic minority group to be elected. Sure, if it was only there, that's symbolic. But she's not. She's a scientific woman, a highly educated woman, a leftist woman, a woman who has been schooled in the organizing on the left in the worst of circumstances before this country actually went through a modicum of democratization. So I, do, I, I highly disagree with it being characterized as purely symbolic. There has been talk of a transformation of society and to neoliberalism and to the war on drugs since the six-year term of Andres Manuel López Obrador began on December 2018. This was his much vaunted fourth transformation. However, the government did not make the deep changes in the political system that it promised. The most progressive achievement of AMLO's government is arguably the increase in the minimum wage, but the broader economic model that it embraced leaves much to be desired. The extractive industries remain intact. Almost half of the federal spending goes to Pemex, the state oil company. The wealthiest continue not to pay the taxes they should. Foreign investment in maquilas and the promotion of mass tourism, both built on the exploitation of the working class and the environmental disposition and de devastation, are put forward as the great hopes for the country's future. Today, in the midst of the hottest spring in history, 85% of the country's municipalities are suffering from drought, while private companies are hoarding water and aquifers. This is how the most violent six-year presidential term in recent decades is coming to a close. So feel free to jump in whenever you want here, Kurt. No, but go ahead. I think this kind of framing is, one, unfair and inaccurate, but also unhelpful. Yeah, the the problem is, it, the, you know, just like in in the nation piece where, you know, Paley wound up basically kind of parroting the, the talking points of, of multinational energy companies to make her energy critique. <laughs> here she strangely kind of uses, you know, right wing, again, right wing arguments to make an ostensibly left-wing critique, and you have to be very careful with that, right? This idea that this is the most violent six-year term is incredibly misleading, and you think she'd know better than that. You think she'd know better than that, right? <laughs> when you talk about total violence numbers against, you know, as compared to a trend, right? If you inherit a high number of violence, you know, <laughs> uh, violent deaths, well, that's, you know, the overall number is going to be higher, right? Um, so, you know, the... the as if the social programs came down to the minimum wage. Maybe that's the only one she wants to talk about, right? The people who I've talked to have a lot to say about, you know, um, the scholarships, have a lot to say about the pensions, have a lot to say about Jovenes uh, Concerned Futuro, have a lot to say about Sembrando Vida, 
right? Uh, it's like how the right wing in Mexico tries to say, oh, they're all just cash transfer programs. When actually the range of social programs in Mexico was actually yeah. quite a bit wider in that sense. And I think she's just kind of banking on the fact that English language readers aren't going to know what the what the raft of social programs were. So I can just say, oh, it just comes down to this. Well, it only comes down to this because this is the only one I want to talk about. And that's misleading, exactly. isn't it? That's misleading. It's absolutely misleading. Absolutely misleading. Yeah. I think it's it's also not an accurate characterization. Now, this is not a worker government. This is not Russia under the Bolsheviks. It's a multi-class coalition. But the part that I always stress, and I think you have to be dishonest to say otherwise, the working class is clearly in the driver's seat. Not only have the minimum wage increase, but a huge expansion of social programs, a reinvestment of the country's resource wealth into the population, a, a facilitation of unionization drives, the democratization of existing union structures, right? There's still a lot more to go in all of those circumstances. But this notion that, you know, it's only the minimum wage increasing, right? And in fact, I was on a different radio program and someone debated, well, that doesn't even matter because so many people are in the informal sector. The minimum wage increases make it so that the water rises for everybody. Yeah, it's a and in fact, effect. does affect the informal class because there is more money circulating and they earn more money. So it's, you know, there's all, it almost, for this argument to work, you have to be dishonest about other things that are happening in the country. When you only do it, like for example, this question about the extractivism, which is a whole discussion that I think merits a more in-depth discussion, right? But extractivism, if that was the only measure to which we are evaluating the government is the government still engaging in extractive activities therefore they're no longer they're not progressive sure okay fine but that's not actually a sound argument there's no there's not it's not sound logic to only view it from that it's also very detached from the realities of people obviously there are very important criticisms happening from progressive sectors from the not from the extra parliamentary left and i think they should be listened to right but framing it especially for an outlet like this which is clearly designed to resonate abroad is actually doing a disservice. And I don't want to get too much into it, um, a, a, you know, word by word, but I do want to point out this whole discussion around militarization. So this has also been one of those, you know, uh, left in form, right in contact kind of arguments. Militarization. First of all, I think we have to define militarization. You can't just throw the word out there. Militarization has expanded beyond anything in living memory. So is militarization the fact that the armed forces are involved more heavily in civilian industries? That could be militarization. Is militarization the actual equipping of police forces and public security forces with more military type equipment? Or is it the creeping use of armed forces in public security? Which one of those is it? And the reason I highlight it is because I think you have to be specific about which ones you're challenging, right? So if we're talking about the armed forces temporarily involved in public security activities, you have to be honest about the conditions in the country, mm -hmm. right? You, I, I mentioned this in other programs. You can't have, you know, street cops with nine millimeters facing off with heavily armed organized crime groups that are being flooded with weapons from the United States. It's putting them up as cannon fodder. And that's not actually going to improve the security situation. Not to mention, and I always stress this, and I wonder why I, I haven't seen a discussion of this yet from these same voices. I would love to hear what they have to say, sincerely, which is that civilian control did not guarantee human rights in this country. Some of the worst cases of human rights abuses happened by civilian police forces. Atenko comes to mind. The repression in Oaxaca in 2006 was carried out by the federal police. Did it matter if it was civilian control or military control? So this argument that strictly Not military control, in 2017. it means that it's inevitably more also the state police, yeah. right? And Which are the ones that they claim yeah. that Lopez Obrador should be funding instead. So I, I think we need to be more careful about the way that we're raising that criticism, given the context in the country. Now, also with a caveat. Um, I, I uh, watched recently a discussion with Astillero, Julio Astillero, who I have a tremendous respect for. And somebody asked him, like, well, why are you worried about militarization? He says, well, historically, the, the armed forces have been unaccountable when they've committed human rights abuses. He's right. Where does accountability come from, though? It's by strengthening democratic control over the armed forces. How do we get that? 
by electing, like we did on Sunday, a strengthened mandate which actually has the capacity to implement the reforms necessary to get us there. Right? We can't be engaging in sort of strictly ideal kinds of arguments in terms of how to address a reality on the ground. Not to mention the fact that, com that many communities are basically begging for the presence of the National Guard in their communities because of the impact. And again, to only frame it this way is also dishonest. It's to pretend as if there hasn't been an entire strategy around attending to the root causes of violence in this country in a way that has never been done before. Did Calderón try to attend to the root causes? Did Peña Nieto? Of course not. But Obrador, to varying degrees of success, has said, the point is we have to give the young people an option. We have to figure out a way so that they're not directly being enticed into this life of organized crime. That's why we have Jóvenes Construyendo Futuro. Here in Mexico City, the Pilares that Claudia created. I mentioned this before. I live in a neighborhood that used to be famous for being dangerous. And talking with neighbors, they all say the same thing. You know what turned it around? Building up Pilares. Because it meant that there were eyes on the street and people were involved and all of those hot spots where all people were involved in crime disappeared. So there are advances when it comes to this, but that doesn't come through ever in this. I don't understand why they choose to take such an adversarial position. I get it. There are critiques. We probably share them. But to take an adversarial position the way that the NGOs have, I don't think is productive. Especially if you take this kind of absurd position that he's the worst president in the, in the, in the world or the galaxy or whatever else. If you're coming from that point of view, well, then you're, of course, you're going to you know, minimize um, you know, the, the achievements of, of the government. And another point, I think it's important. If you're going to criticize, you know, I think you're right. We should kind of, what is your criticism of the militarization? And these should be debated. If you're going to criticize the use of the military in infrastructure and, you know, uh, areas such as, for example, uh, aduanas and, you know, ports and such, you can't do that, you know, um, in good faith without mentioning the dismantling of the Mexican state over the last 30 years. This is a fundamental point that they seem to just elide over, right? That hundreds of state agencies were privatized, um, you know, all decades and generations of expertise in the Mexican public sector were gotten rid of, were wholesale gotten rid of. I mean, this was just a process to dismantle the Mexican state completely. Not as far as Chile, but pretty close. I heard that there was at least over a thousand, you know, state institutions and agencies that were privatized over those 30 years. So Mexico lost enormous expertise in things like architecture, engineering, public works, public health, right? All of these things that, you know, came to the fore over the, you know, um, uh, all these things that came to the fore over, uh, over the past six years for a variety of reasons. What is the institution that retains some of these? For better or for worse, the military. Military engineers, military architects, it's the military know-how in some of these things. I'm not defending it. I have my critiques of it too, but I'm not coming at this from a bad faith position. I'm trying to understand why, you know, the military, you know, came to have to supplant services that were outsourced, privatized, and eliminated from the Mexican state, you know, systematically over 30 years. And you just simply can't ignore that point and say, well, you know, the military is bad. Well, then so is the Army Corps of Engineers. Maybe it is. You can argue against the Army Corps of Engineers, right? But, you know, doing these kinds of public works is part of Mexico's military's mission statement. It's in their mission statement. Yes. It's in there. So, yep. you know, you can argue this or not, but it's in there. And, you know, for better or for worse, and maybe for worse in a lot of cases, they retained, you know, a technical capacity to execute projects that, you know, uh, were stripped away through kleptocracy, through corruption, through cronyism, through handing over, you know, basically whole secretariats to cronies and their families and their businesses. Look what happened with Xochitl Galvez's, you know, pass through federal government, right? It was all just shoveling contracts to her own companies. We saw this with uh, Vicente Fox's stepsons with Oceania, right? We saw this over and over again with the companies of the people in government. So you get to the point where the government was inoperative 
I'm not saying don't criticize the military, obviously, but, you know, don't just elide over this point that the state was dismantled, both ideologically and through corruption and cronyism. And I'll make one final point. There's actually a very more recent parallel to all of this, right? We don't have to look to the Army Corps of Engineers. Just look to Venezuela. People don't realize the reason Hugo Chavez implemented the Misiones Sociales, the, the much lauded social programs there, was because the state didn't exist. The bureaucracy couldn't provide that services. And even if it did, it was full of the old regime that impeded it, which is true here today. And that Unión Cívico Militar, as it's known in Venezuela, is also the reason why in 2002, when they attempted a coup, the loyal forces went and rescued him, which is another factor that I don't think is given sufficient consideration when it comes to this. Like it or not, you have to keep the armed forces happy because if they're unhappy, they will oust you from power. And I think if the re election result was a lot closer, there were probably some forces that would have considered doing it just a few days ago. This is a real thing in Latin America. This is the reality of Latin America. You have to be conscious of the coup plotters. It happened in Bolivia. Who would have thought that after their process, which is so consolidated, we would have seen a military coup d'etat in 2019, but it happened. Despite the fact they changed their military doctrine, this is a real threat. If this keeps them happy and it keeps constitutional order, I'm arguably okay with it.